When a fire engulfs a house and two bodies are found, people start to think it was a horrible accident. But then a man comes forward and says, a demon did it. And then we travel to Russia to spend a nice afternoon with a man enjoying his hobby, diving. But while he's exploring the dark depths of Finnish Bay, he comes face to face with a homicidal creature today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. If you listened to yesterday's episode, I'm true to my word. I'm recording this episode only an hour after yesterday's episode. It's so hot. I'm going to really see how many of these guys I can get. It's not, it's not quantity over quality. They still will be good. Don't skip the next couple episodes. I just want to see if I can get these done because it's so hot. I really have to find that perfect time to record. I am in a closet after all. A haunted closet, which makes it 10 degrees hotter. Let's go ahead and give a shout out to one of our legacy Patreon supporters coming into Dead Rabbit Command right now. Everyone get on your feet. I don't care if you're driving a car. Stand up and give a round of applause to Al Tyus. Everyone give a round of applause to Al Tyus. We've just caused 10 car accidents, but it was worth it. Al, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. You guys can support the Patreon. That's fine, too. Just help spread the word about the show. Really, really helps out a lot. Now, longtime listeners of the show know I take a break every 50 episodes. But I'm going to take three weeks off in July. There's not going to be any bonus episodes. I'm not, I mean, a ghost going to literally possess me and I won't report on it. I'm not doing anything with the show for three weeks. So really, I'm looking at it like this. If I can get these next 13 episodes done, because it's I'm going to have enough episodes to take me to that three weeks, I'm golden, dude. You're like, Jason, just, <laughs> just focus on the quality of the show. Don't go on this breakneck speed. But yeah, so I will be taking a three-week break in the month of July. So from July 8th to pretty much August 3rd will be my break. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. <laughs> Apparently, I'm getting possessed by a ghost. Oh, and I want to say this. It's a three-week non-interrupted break except for one thing, and I'll do constant reminders for this. We are going to have a July, of course we got to do this, a July 18th Alien Invasion special, and it's brought to you by the movie The Quiet Place 2. So we're going to be doing that on July 18th. We're going to do it as a YouTube live stream. So if you want to join us, we'll have more information of like times and and dates, obviously, (laughs) July 18th. And then we're going to upload that to the podcast. I'm going to clean up the audio, do a little bit of editing. So if you don't do the YouTube thing or if you're not there immediately. But um, I guess I can announce the time right now. Let's do... um, No, I'm too too hot to figure out a time. I'll let you know. I'm too hot to literally understand how clocks work. But I'm not too hot to tell you some stories. Some spooky, spooky stories. Al Tyus, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the rabbit rocket ship. We don't use this enough. We're not going to space, but we don't use it enough. I'm going to toss you the keys to the rabbit rocket ship. We are leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command. We are headed out to Burnley in England. (laughs) Dead Rabbit Rocket Ship is taking us over there. It's October 1st, 2020. We're in Burnley. That's in Lancashire in England. October 1st, 2020. A fire is burning through a house. And the firefighters... They have different sirens over there because they're weird. Fire engine pulls up. What's all this then? And the firefighters get out and they start spraying the house with water. If you don't know what firefighters do, I don't know why I'm going in so much detail. And then eventually the, the firefighters do go into the building. They're chopping down doors. And they go, Oh! Somebody call the cops. The police get there. And what's happened is the firefighters have discovered two bodies. One, the body of Dr. Saman Mir Sakarvi, 49-year-old woman. That's her house. And they found the body of her daughter as well, uh, Vian Mangrio, a 14-year-old girl. So the police are investigating this, and they go, does it look like they burned to death? And the firefighters are like, we're not coroners. Go take it. We don't know. So the police are like, oh, we're hoping we'd be able to have a short day. If I solve 13 murders today, I get to take a vacation. So the police, they go take the bodies to the coroner. Coroner goes, oh, these people have been murdered. They actually died before the fire because they don't have any smoke in their lungs. So now it's a murder investigation. They thought it was an accident, but it's not. 
And so they start watching CCTV because literally every square inch of Britain has a camera pointed at it. And they see the handyman of the house. Dr. Shaman hired a handyman. It is Shabazz Khan. He's a 51-year-old man. And they see him like just kind of walking out of the house the day before the fire. So they don't really have video of him on the day of the fire, but the day before he was there. So they go talk to him. And he's like, yeah, I'm a handyman. She hired me. I come and do the stuff at their house. He is like giving all these answers. And he's like, yeah, I'm a handyman. You know, he's telling him about the job. He has a perfect alibi, right? I was there the day before, but I wasn't there when these bodies were found. And the police officers are walking around and they go, what's all this then? And it's the doctor's jewelry. Dr. Saman's jewelry was at his house. And they go, why do you have this? And he's like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Why does anyone have anything, officer? And then the officers get a subpoena for us. It's Britain. I don't even know if they need a subpoena. They get his phone. And they find a Google search on there. What is DNA? That's one of the Google searches. That could have been anything, right? He could have been trying to figure out who Dana was. He misspelled it. Or maybe he just watched an episode of Beekman's World. His other Google search. Can we get... This is bad grammar, too. I mean, I guess he, I guess he is suspected of murdering people. But she should at least have good grammar. Here's his, here's his Google search, word for word. Can we get DNA from burn bodies for investigations? So at this point, the cops are like, okay, this guy's our best suspect. He's the last person who left the house alive, even though it was a day before. He knew the house inside and out. There's jewelry here. <laughs> and he was trying to see if burn bodies would hide DNA. So they arrest him. And he confesses. Kind of. So this is currently working its way through the court system. This case is currently working through the court system. So everything I said was alleged. Now <laughs> it's all retroactive alleged. His alibi, he says, yes, my physical body murdered those people, but I was possessed by a djinn. Now, it's, this is interesting because we've covered jinns on this show before. We've covered them a couple times. And a jinn is basically the Islamic version. What's interesting about this was I always thought it was an Islamic version of a demon. That they were kind of interchangeable. They were fallen spirits. But... This dude, Shabazz, uses the term interchangeably with just a run-of-the-mill ghost. We, we don't think of, you know, Abraham Lincoln's ghost floating through the White House. We don't compare him to Ball Bareth. It's two separate things. So I don't know if jinns are ghosts, if there is, if all ghosts are considered jinn in Muslim culture. I don't know. But he says he was possessed by a jinn, and this jinn was actually, used to be a living person. Which is something else we covered in an episode. Can he be possessed by a ghost? So this guy is basically a greatest hits of Dead Rabbit Radio. He believes that he was possessed by a djinn. And when the cops are talking to him, he starts, I know this is a podcast. You couldn't see what I was doing, but maybe you heard it. He started doing jerking motions. He started getting all herky jerky, like he was walking like the girl from the ring. <laughs> the cops come over, they're like, We'd like to ask you a few questions. He's like, Sure, can I get you some tea? And he's all jerking around, arr, 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 spilling tea everywhere. He has to build his alibi somehow, right? Which has like some soup, some like some super hot soup. They're like, No, sir, the tea, the empty tea cups you gave us was enough. He starts herky jerking. This is the story he says. He goes, Listen, you caught me. You, <laughs> you searched my phone. You found this jewelry, but I didn't do this. I was at her house, and she wanted me to do renovations on it. I am a handyman. And while I was there, I was using my hammer. I was putting some nails and stuff. And a gin named Robert Smith Wood showed up. It's actually a 620-year-old spirit who had been haunting this house. It's a, it's a, I don't know how old the house was. I don't know if this was Castle Grayskull. But apparently this whole this old, wrinkly, old 600-year-old ghost is floating down the street one day and goes, that, that'll look like a nice spot. But anyway, so, so the 600-year-old ghost is haunting this house, and he goes, it got mad that I was doing renovations on it. And there was actually another ghost there named Rita. She was a little more polite, but he would, like, throw stuff around. Like, he one time he moved the dining room table. One time Vian, the young girl, was walking around, and Robert would grab her hair. This ghost out of nowhere would grab her hair and start yanking on it. And it hated them. Rita loved them. He goes, I remember the last day I was there. I was walking out of the house. And as I was walking out, 
Dr. Simone was sitting there and she was talking to Rita, just sitting in the kitchen, just talking to her, talking to the spirit. But I didn't murder anybody. I didn't murder anybody. I My guess is, is that the gin known as Robert Smith Wood possessed me. And I went back there and I murdered everybody. But I didn't do it. I think it was just, I was possessed. Now the police obviously aren't like, they're not scared. They don't run to the cop car and call for backup. They just arrest the guy. Because really what he's done is he's confessed. They arrest the guy and they take him into a cell. And at one point he's sitting in the cell. And he is told, you know you're under observation. Like there's a camera in this cell. We can see what you're doing all the time. And then they left. I don't know if they were setting him up for this or something. But I guess he was just sitting in the cell totally normal. And this is the prosecutor's argument, right? This is the prosecutor's argument. But because they showed this tape during the trial. I would have loved to see this. They say that they told him that he was being observed in his cell. And then after that, he started flying around the room. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's a bit of a, he began. I don't want to say floating because even that the jury would be like, not guilty. He's clearly not on the ground. He threw himself around the room. He's like, oh, oh, and he's basically acting like Robert Smith Wood is throwing him around. And the cops came in while he was getting pummeled. And he goes, oh, dude, the second you guys told me I was under observation, Robert Smith Wood is like, ah, oh, I'm going to beat you up on camera. And he began choking me and he threw me on the bed. The cops are looking at each other and they're like, make sure, make sure we use this in the trial because it shows that he's lying. He was perfectly fine in here until we told him he was being videotaped. And then he started flying, quote unquote, flying around the room, throwing himself around the room. So this is an interesting story. It's an ongoing criminal trial. We'll see if we get any more news of it going forward. I'd love to watch that video. It's Britain's funny some videos. He's like, oh, but here's the thing. Let's put on our conspiracy caps for this. We're being told that this guy faked it. But for all we know, there's hours of footage of this guy just getting horribly throttled by this demon. He's floating around. His head's spinning around. His legs are sticking out of his ear. It's just like all this inhuman stuff. And the prosecutor's like, no, we're not going to show that. We're not going to show the part where a portal opens up and Satan comes down, and starts punching him in the stomach as Robert is holding him down. We're not going to show that. We'll show this one clip. And I don't even know if the clip is a cop looking through the cell and being like, you're on candid camera, and then leaving and then him throwing himself around. Or if they just took a clip of him throwing himself around and go, oh, we told him he was on camera. So who knows? You know, when we're talking about this show, Dead Rabbit Radio, we know that there's frauds out there. We talk about them a lot, but we believe in this stuff. Or maybe you don't believe in this stuff. Maybe you just find entertainment value in it, and that's totally fine too. But I personally believe in demons. I personally believe in ghosts and things like that. So it's not out. It's not outside the realm of possibility that he could be telling the truth. I don't think he is. I don't think he is, and I think that it's... Po but you know what's weird about it? What I can't wrap my head around is they see him walking out the day before the fire... So who said the fire? That's not answered. So are they saying he murdered them a day before and then the fire just spontaneously... Which would make me think a demon had something to do with it, right? So who knows what's going on with it? He'll most likely be found guilty, right? There's not a, Most juries are going to just agree and go, he probably killed this guy. Especially with the phone search and stuff like that. But who set the fires? This is the problem with juries this is the problem with juries because you get people like me you get people like me where you have all this evidence laid out against him you have he has possession of his jewels oh the demon stole them you have the searches on the phone the chin loves google he loves it you have all this stuff but then there's like one unanswered question i'm like but wait a second who set the fires so i'm like sitting in the car i'm like not guilty i was on a grand jury the other day and they basically were like this was actually two or three years ago i think it was even before i did the podcast but i was not i was not invited back i was not invited back i don't know how much i can talk about it like a cop comes in and tells you the story and then the cop leaves and we discuss it. And then a cop comes in and tells a different story, tells spooky stories. We're like, oh, no, it's so scary. Is he still out there? They're like, yes, if you do not indict this man, he will murder again. I was not invited back. They had a reunion party. They're like, yay, we indicted everyone. Let's not call Jason. But yeah, I would be not a good juror. I've gone... I've, I've never, I've sat through trials, right? But I've never been selected as a juror before. <laughs> Probably good reason there'd be tons of criminals on the streets. Anyways, 
So we'll f we'll see if we get more information about this, but it is creepy. And it would be creepy, too, if we lived in a world where this was so common that that was a viable defense. Like, you could actually say, well, yeah, they did get murdered, and I did do it. So, yeah, we'll see if we get more information on that, but I thought it was a really interesting story. I love it when true crime and paranormal collide, and Conspiracy's just sitting in the corner. He's like, I'll get you next time. I love it when we have a confluence. Is that a word? Where things kind of come together. Altius. I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to that famed carpenter copter. We are leaving behind. We are leaving behind England. We are headed out to Mother Russia. <laughs> Specifically, we're headed to Finnish Bay. That's in the St. Petersburg region in Russia. It's summer 1997. It's the middle of the day. And at Finnish Bay, we're going to meet a young man. His name is Nikolay M. He is an officer on a submarine in the Russian military and an amateur diver. He's like, oh, these submarines, they're so lame. I'd rather do it myself. He he's carrying torpedoes everywhere. He keeps sinking. But he does on his off time when he's, when he's not underwater with 100 men. He likes to go underwater by himself. He's swimming in the shallow waters of Finnish Bay. And while he's down there, he sees a cucumber-shaped object. It's quite large. I mean, it's not the size of a submarine, but it's about the size of a man. So maybe six, seven feet long. Just a tube that's kind of bent. It, it, it's not like a metal cylinder. It looks like a cucumber. It looks a little natural, maybe. Like a rock outcropping. It doesn't look like it's a piece of a vehicle. It looks more natural than that. He's swimming down and he sees this large cucumber-shaped thing. He goes down, he's kind of fiddling around with it and realizes it's loose. He's never seen anything like this and he can tell that it's not a rock. So he goes, well, I'm going to tie some ropes to it and try to drag it to shore because we're on the shallow end of it. So he ties some ropes to it and he's trying to swim away and he can't budge it. That only piques his interest even more. He's trying to figure out what this is. He goes back on land, he gets some gear. And he brings his car closer to the water and starts wrapping on these straps. His goal is to just pull it out with his car. I mean, this guy is determined. It's the tastiest cucumber ever. He has a giant salad he needs to make. He swims back under there. And he knows that he's going to have to attach the straps to this cucumber by drilling holes into it. So he actually has a drill, like an underwater drill with him. I don't know if that's normal amateur diving gear. But he has an underwater drill. Maybe it's just a regular drill that he wrapped a plastic bag around. I don't know. But he takes this drill. He goes underwater. And he has these hooks that are tethered to his car bumper. But he has to drill into the cucumber to get these hooks into this cucumber thing. And he takes the drill and he goes... Ding! And he feels the drill going into this cucumber-shaped object. And then a dark oil-like liquid starts to seep out of the hole he's creating. And he's pushing that drill. He's pushing that drill. And when he sees that black oil start to leak out more and more, he pushes it in harder. And when he pushes it down even harder, he hears a loud crack from inside the cucumber. Now the black oil has been replaced with a thick blood-like liquid. It's surrounding him. He's underwater, and he has this drill in this thing, and now he just sees thick red fluid surrounding him. The object cracks open. And this is a really curious word. I, I'm taking this exactly how it's said in the story, and I can't really visual it, visualize it. The cucumber cracks open, and a dull bubble floats out. That's really I mean, like, I can picture it, you know, because when you blow bubbles, you they're kind of shining, reflective, but it's hard for me. I mean, I can picture it, but it's just, it seems unnatural. A dull bubble floats out of this thing. And then a humanoid creature starts to rise out of the cucumber. He said its skin was unnaturally white. And it's just kind of floating. It looks... Like it's not moving under its own volition. It's just kind of floating with the water. And he sees its back has this massive hole in it. <laughs> this, dr this drill bit sized hole in its back. 
he drilled into this cucumber. And when he pushed harder, it penetrated this thing's back. And it's now bleeding underwater. And it's just floating there. But as, as it's floating, it's starting to rotate. And Nikolai is looking directly into its eyes. He doesn't give any description of this creature other than it's humanoid. So we have to assume it has the typical eyes, nose, mouth. The skin is unnaturally white. And one thing he learns very, very quickly. As this creature is turning and it's looking straight at Nikolay, its mouth is opening and closing silently. And I know I know I made noises, but I just can't do that for the podcast. You can't see what I'm doing. But he was doing it silently. And he, as he's looking into this creature's eyes, they felt hypnotic. He felt, Nikolay felt that he couldn't stare at this thing's eyes too long. Something fills Nikolay with fear. Probably the giant monster in front of him. And he pushes this thing away from him. He just has this feeling he needs to get it away from him. And when he pushes it, this creature grabs Nikolay's wrist. And that's when he realizes another inhuman feature about this thing. Long, razor-sharp fingernails. They dig into his wrist. And blood begins to shoot out of his own body. And this creature has a vice-like grip on his wrist. And it's holding him. It's shredding the skin. It's tearing muscle. It's getting towards the bone. But in Nikolay's other hand, he has a power drill. Ding! He pushes that drill right into this creature's chest. The next thing, this is so interesting. The next thing Nikolay knows, he's back on surface. And there's people standing around him. Someone drug him out of the water. He was unconscious underwater. They drag him out. And you think, oh, was it just a dream? Was he having one of those underwater dreams? Was he pretending he was in a submarine and he just forgot that he wasn't and then thought he could... Be no, it wasn't just a dream because when he regains consciousness, he also regains the searing pain in his hand. He actually lost part of his hand in this attack. Whatever it was took off a chunk of his hand. He told people what had happened and other people went in to find this thing the object, nor the creature, was ever seen again. This comes from a magazine called Secret Researchers. It actually was a Russian magazine. Secretine Islo Devonia, which means <laughs> Secret Researchers, number 12. It was published in 1999. I got it from one of my favorite websites. Think about it, docs.com. Great story. I love this one. I actually had this in my file for uh, pretty much since 1997. I've had this one for probably about a year. And I don't know why I haven't told it yet. I really like this story. It, it pops for me on so many levels. Um, one, I love it because it takes place during the day. You don't get a lot of paranormal stuff that takes place during the day. So things are more clear, right? It's not like I might have seen something in the woods. Two, you have someone going, you have a human, which I'm very pro-human, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some sort of spooky monster, and the human comes out on top. Well, I mean, he did lose part of his hand, but you know what I mean? Like, I always like stories where the human race overcomes these creatures. To be fair, to be fair, he did put a power drill through this thing's back. So, I mean, we, as a species, kind of started this thing. But I love this story. You got a, a man being attacked by a monster, the man surviving. Now, obviously, like I say all the time, this story could be fake. This story could totally be fake, right? But if the story's true, it has really interesting implications. Because we talk so, when we, if one, what was this thing, right? There's a couple different things you could think. When I read this story, what my go-to thing was, and yours could totally be different, is that this was alien, this was kind of how I figured this out. And, and this, I, I think this is really interesting. We always think of aliens as like fleets and organizations, troops, you know, the Galactic Federation coming down, get rid of your nuclear bombs. We're going to wave our finger at you until you do. I mean, not, not that, that's probably a noble goal in the end. But the aliens are constantly putting their noses on our business, clean up the environment, all that stuff. Or they're reptilians and they have this massive armada. They're eating our children in Antarctica and stuff like that. I don't... 
And while those stories are interesting, I mean, they're pretty mainstream, but what I think is more realistic when we're talking about aliens is what I call the, I don't know, the Spanish Galleon theory. Where sure, there was an organization to move boats from Portugal and Spain and England and France. They're all trying to explore and find new trade routes and stuff like that. But before we got to the age of discovery or whatever it's called, there were just ships that were launched and everybody died. There was probably far more explorers who have died and we never knew about, like some Viking dudes or some dudes in Brazil who were like, we're going to build this giant boat. We're going to see what's out there. And then they just disappeared. There's probably way more explorers that died that history never knew about way before Christopher Columbus and stuff like that. There's probably uncounted explorers from every corner of the planet that went out. That And so I think, yeah, sure, Alien Federation, stuff like that. But I think there's no proof of that. That's all theory. That's all theory. But if aliens are out there, you're more likely to have that alien ship that is launched from a planet that is that set of alien explorers. And the mission goes wrong because most of them would. Space is a very hostile environment. I love the movie Alien for a lot of reasons, but one of my favorite reasons is one of the most simple. In the movie Alien, they're on this ship, and they're going to land on this planet because they've got a distress call. And it's like a five-minute scene, maybe three-minute scene, but of the ship... And these people have been in space for like... like Humans have been in space for like three or four hundred years at this point. It's not unusual to be in space. They have all the vehicles. They're actually like just mining planets. They're like ore miners. Space has become so mundane that you could just get a 9-to-5 job where you're flying around in space. But when they go to land on this planet, it's like three minutes of them constantly like hitting gears and buttons and the ship's getting all wrecked and everything like that. And it's, it's, it's to sh- that scene is so brilliant because it shows that even though you've been flying in space for 400 years as a civilization, every time you landed on a planet, you'd have no idea what was going to happen. It wasn't until you built spaceports and had an infrastructure that it would be a smooth landing. It would be the equivalent of trying to land a 747 on just some farmland because you were out of fuel. Like, you could do it. It's not going to be comfortable. So I love, that's such an amazing scene. It, it's, it would never be mundane to land on an unexplored alien planet. That ship, and it's like in the first 20 minutes. It's not even like they're building up this big thing. It's just to show how dangerous it is to explore. And that's what it would be. So I'm imagining when I read the story, I go, what if this was some sort of life pod? And he'd been down there for who knows how long, or he just came down a couple weeks ago. But his ship was in orbit. Something happened. And this was an escape pod. And it lands underwater, and this is what it does. It just stays there until someone else can pick it up. I know that this is headcanon and stuff. I have no proof for any of this, but the reason why I think it's a life pod is because, one, it's a protective container, and the guy's drilling through it, and first it hits, like, this oil substance, but then when it cracks open, that dull bubble floats out. And I'm like, was that the oxygen this creature was breathing? Was this basically in the environment this creature was encased in? Because he wasn't in the bubble. The bubble floats out, and then he is floating out after it. So, imagine if you were on this explorer mission, and something went wrong, and your ship crashed. And you're in the middle of the galactic nowhere. And you're in this pod, and then some dude walks up and puts a drill through it, and through you. Now, the creature disappeared, the object disappeared, but Nicolay still bore the injuries of this encounter. Where did the creature go? Why did it take the cucumber-shaped object with it? Where is it now? Did it survive the encounter? Did its hypnotic eyes somehow cause Nicolay to lose consciousness? Was that a other self-defense mechanism outside of the razor-sharp talons. It's just a fascinating story because I I do believe in aliens. I do believe in aliens. We can quibble all day long over where they come from, but I do believe there are other intelligences and things like that. I'm a little iffy on the Galactic Federation and stuff like that, but 
the idea of we explore, we put people on an object and push that object off and hope to get riches or your name on a map or discover a new trade route or exploit resources and people, unfortunately. I imagine other humanoid type species would do the same thing. And we look at our explorers and we go, man, those people who go up into space, those people on the space shuttle, they sure are brave. Like anything could go wrong. And they're just stranded up there. And you can imagine on some alien planet, they also hold these interplanetary, intergalactic possibly, travelers in high esteem. They wave goodbye and they say goodbye to their families and they get on their ship. They take off. And the distances are so vast and the time they're going to spend is so long, so dangerous that no one knows truly if they're going to return. But they take the journey anyways. They are explorers of the cosmos. But then something goes wrong and one of them ends up in the shallow waters in Finnish Bay. Gets a power drill through the back. I just find the story fascinating. I find the idea of exploration fascinating. It's a fascinating story. Originally, I was going to wrap it up with a creepy way of saying, maybe there's more of them out there. Maybe the next time you're in the water, you see a giant cucumber. <laughs> Jason, now I'm never going to go near it. I thought of telling a scary ending, but you know what? Like, yeah, you have to kind of give a respect to that level of bravery to leave behind your home and not know if you'll ever, ever even see it again. We're not, we're not going to give this super white, super white, talent-filled monster man with hypnotic eyes a sad ending. We're going to give this monster, we're going to give this underwater monster a salute. So to all the explorers out there, on Earth and in the stars, I hope your travels fill you with knowledge. I hope your journeys are safe. And I hope you come in peace. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Peace.